Hi everyone. Welcome to another session. With me, Megha Mawandia, your parent coach and counselor from Triok, talking to you today about setting limits. I just want to wait a couple of minutes to see if anybody else is will wanting to join us so that they can have the time to be able to do the same. And today we're going to talk about setting limits. We've already covered quite a few topics over these last few weeks in quarantine. And it's been nice hearing from you all and hearing how these tips have been helping you in your family life to make this entire challenging situation of working from home, parenting, housekeeping, taking care of the elderly, just all the roles that you've had rolled into one at the same time. Not an easy task for any of us, so do give yourself a moment to pat yourself on the back and say, great job, you survived till now. <laughs> so today's topic is uh, setting limits. And uh, one recurring theme that's been coming my way when we've been talking about uh, limit uh, when we've been talking about parenting in these times is how the children are becoming are they taking on the mantle of being the king or queen in the household they're really the ones calling all the shots they're the ones uh, who are controlling how and what needs to be done and a lot is revolving around that so uh, I want and that's that's a stressful situation because parents have very little room to maneuver and more importantly, they don't know which is the part to give in, which is the part to hold on to, where should they be making which choice. It's uh, challenging regardless. So keeping that in mind, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, setting limits. We're going to talk about the child's brain, the development of the child's brain. We're going to talk about what limits need to look like. Uh, how to choose which limits to set and how to set those limits in a way that doesn't feel challenging, doesn't mean that you're like pushing and, and you know, really at logger's head because that's not an ideal situation in the house. So, child's brain, let's talk about that. Um, your child's brain is a developing brain. It's human babies are not born with a fully functional brain. So when you look at other animals in the animal kingdom, you even look at large mammals like the elephant or the giraffe who are able to stand up within hours, if not minutes of their birth. Um, the human baby can't. It takes the vertebra, it takes the human baby at least uh, till the age of three, three and a half for them to have a fully functional vertebra. So step by step from their ability to turn, to sit, to lift their head, to sit, to crawl, to walk, to be able to walk downstairs without support and walk backwards. That's really the entire, it takes that long for a human baby to be able to do something as basic as being able to walk. Now if the human baby is taking so much time to walk, can we imagine what is going on in that head and how much time they need for their brain to really develop? Um, scientists have uh, done a calculation backward and they've seen the gestational period for human babies would be much longer uh, if it weren't for the size of the head. So children are actually born, human babies are born half-baked. Uh, that means they're not ready to be in terms of the other animals in the animal kingdom because if we waited for longer, if gestational period was longer in the mother's stomach, the baby would not be able to cross through the birthing canal. And because the baby would not be able to cross the birthing canal, nature evolved in a way for our children to be born in. So why is that relevant for us as parents today that that's what nature intended, that's what it is? The relevant feature here is to understand that because they are half-baked, because they are still developing, they do not have the cognitive ability to make decisions for themselves. They are really like headless chicken going about 
picking what they want, how they want, putting their finger into a socket, touching fire. They're not in a, in a position to be able to do decision making in a longer term. So when does this ability come? So just like for a baby, the time an average baby starts to walk around uh, 12 months of age um, and it takes them 12 months from birth till they actually take that first step to develop all the building blocks required to be able to walk. It's not like you pick up a baby and you put them down on the ground for the first time at 12 months and they're going to be able to walk. It's not going to happen. They need to go through all the steps. Just like that, the human brain takes 27 years to have the cognitive ability to think like an adult. 27 years. That's a really large number. So what does that mean for you and me? It means that our brain is still developing well into the 20s. It means parents play a very important role, parents and caregivers play a very important role to protect their children and young adults to be able to do that decision making by the time they're 27. It also means just like with a one year old, the first time they put their feet on the ground cannot be at age one. They have to fall. They have to experience failure. They have to try again. Just like that, even a child needs to experience trial and error and effort and failure. All of that for them by the end of 27 to have a fully cognitive functioning brain. So again, what does this mean to us? Is this a science lecture? No, it's not. It's really about us understanding the importance of setting limits. We as parents need to be the ones in control. The ship cannot be driven by our children. But should these limits be like really, you know, autocratic limits that uh, uh, I had a parent who spoke to me about, uh, I decide when my child should eat what? And I said, okay, what is the logic behind you deciding? She said, I don't know, I just decide. I just like my child to hear no two times. So no matter what my child asks, I just say no twice before I give them permission to do something. That is not what we are looking at when we're talking about setting limits. We're not talking about limits which are driven by emotion, which are driven by um, this, this social construct of this is what it should be, so I do this. So because everybody is sitting in Zoom calls for 45 minutes, I expect my two-year-old to also sit in that Zoom call for 45 minutes. That's not what limits look like. So number one, what do limits look like? Um, you need to pick your battle. You need to decide which is the limit that is relevant for you today. So each of us, so now actually you have green zones and you have orange zones and then you have these red zones. And in all of these different zones, everybody has a different lifestyle. Uh, there are parents who are going into work. So there is this idea of full-time work that has started. Uh, there are uh, parents who are not going into work. There are parents in red zones also who are going into work. There are children in various age groups, somewhere there is a caregiver at home, somewhere there isn't. Each of our situation is unique and it is becoming increasingly unique as the country is opening up in its own, uh, its own organic fashion. Um, so we need to pick which is the battle that we want to focus on. You're not going to be able to fight all battles first. So you need to decide, am I going to work on my bedtime routine? Am I going to get onto independent eating? Am I going to get into independent play? Uh, what is it that I want to bring in the limit for? Once you have uh, some sort of a grip about what it is that you're looking at a limit for, you need to work on yourself. So I had a parent who worked with me for over a year to get her child to sleep in a separate room. And for one year, we would sit in call after call and she'd like, Bent and no, but I need my sleep and I need this child to sleep in a separate room. Mega, that's all I'm asking from you. Just make her sleep in a separate room. And uh, there was a lot of stuff we needed to do to be able to get that child to sleep in a separate room. 
Now, I'm warning you, I was extremely skeptical of this goal since the time the mother asked it, but because it was her goal and she is the parent, she gets to call the shots. I was like, okay, I'm going to help you with this. At the end of a year, the child slept in a separate room. The very next day, the mother called me distraught. She said, my husband and I have fought all night because we feel our child's childhood has been taken from us. We want her back in our room. So, so often we come up with these limits, which because people are telling us that, oh, your child should sleep in a separate room, we are not ready to let go. And in our work, trio, family and parenting, we don't believe that we need to take these very black and white rules and decisions of what should be or shouldn't be. The should be or shouldn't be is going to be extremely unique to you. And we need to make that the star and we need to follow that uniqueness which is there in your family. So we really need to work on ourselves. Why are we setting this limit? What will this change for me? What long-term change am I looking in my child by setting this limit? Is this limit coming because I'm tired? It's a fair enough limit. Is it coming because I'm getting a lot of social anxiety looking at Instagram and Facebook and what all these people are doing around me or is it coming that I'm seeing this need in my child I'm seeing this developmental change in my child and I think I need to harness that so I need to set this limit so we really need to work on ourselves and we need to be ready to set that limit so uh, just last week I had a parent who called me up and the first she, she was just venting because there was a lot of stress going on there's the COVID situation around her and there were multiple challenges going on and her child was acting out and watching television and bedtime was challenging, everything. And uh, after she finished talking about her challenges, um, instead of telling her what to do with her child, I spent our session just talking to her about how she was feeling and what she could do to take care of herself. And before we hung up, she... Uh, she remarked, very shocked. She said, this is not how I expected our session to go. I said, oh, why? What happened? Uh, because in my head, it was very obvious what I was doing. But uh, she said, no, I thought you will start telling me I need to do this with my son, this with my son. And I actually prepared myself for half an hour before I got into the session with you that I'm going to have to now pull up my socks and do a lot of stuff. And I said, that's just it. You are not in a mental frame right now to be doing that. If setting limits is feeling so burdensome, what that actually means is you as a parent needs to be taken care of. And it is only when you as a parent are taken care of, are you going to be able to set limits without feeling anxiety, without feeling pressured, without feeling, feeling like this heavy lead on your chest about setting limits. So we need to be very careful about where we are emotionally about setting limits. And I have spoken about this week after week after week, that your parenting is only going to be as good as you are feeling. So we need to know when this time out is required for us, how to take it, when to take it, and what we need to do to take it. There is no limit that is urgent. There is no habit that we cannot work on later. But for sure, if you're not emotionally in the right place to handle your child's limits, you're not going to be in, if you're not emotionally in the place to be handling yourself, your own feelings, you're not going to be able to set limits with your child. So this needs to be very clear and I hope it's really starring in your thinking that first we need to work on ourselves and uh, Similarly, like that parent I spoke to you uh, about a week ago, last week, where she asked me, where, she were, where we worked on her feelings instead of setting limits, uh, the next session we did, and I spoke to her, she had a, a skip in her voice. She was happy, she was, uh, well, happy would be a stretch, but she was more in control. And that's when we were able to actually talk about limits with her child. So we need to give us that, give ourselves that time to take care of, of ourselves before we're going to be able to start setting limits with our children. 
so uh, so we've talked about what the limit should be that you need to pick one battle don't don't try to set limits across the board you can't do everything we've talked about what emotional state we need to be in uh, which is sort of just the environment the first layer before we're going to set any limits um and uh, then we need to um Then we need to look at how, what is going to be my emotional makeup when I'm setting these limits. And uh, we need that emotional makeup to be calm. It needs to be not hurried. It needs to be not outsourced. Um, is my voice slightly lower? Okay, Prathma is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to come closer and hopefully you're going to hear me better. Please do put it in the comments if you're not able to hear me too well. And I'll try to speak up even louder. So, um, as I was saying, we need to set limits with an equilibrium around uh, within us. So it needs to be set without any anger, and most importantly, there should be no justification. So your limit is not one which your child has to understand. If you remember at the beginning of the call, what I said was. We need to be in control because my child's brain is still developing. So if my child's brain is still developing, expecting my child to understand why I am setting that limit is pointless. It's, it's really making no sense. So we need to stop justifying our limits to our children and feeling the need to provide that justification. In essence, that justification actually is our own insecurity. Because we're not ready to take the full responsibility of this limit. Over a period of time. So parenting is your biggest uh, long term um, uh, endeavor. Where you only know what the results are. Or even if at that you do know. After 30, 40, 50 years of being on the job. It's only when your children become parents. Do they maybe come and tell you. Pat on the back. Mom, dad, you did a decent job. Uh, so we need to have that confidence in the limit ourselves to carry it forward because you're not necessarily going to get that feedback you're expecting from your child. So I just want to recap what we've talked about for those of you who've, uh, had, who've joined in a little later. Um, this is Megha Mavandia for those of you who are new to me and uh, we're talking about setting limits. And uh, hi, hi Alfred, hi Nidhi, Pratma, Roshni, it's so, Raju, it's so nice to see you guys and interact with you all on this live session today. So we've been talking about setting limits and we've been talking about why it is so important for us to set limits. Um, the reasons why limits are important is because our children do not have the cognitive ability to make these decisions for themselves. So we need to scaffold it and make them. Uh, we need to start setting limits by picking the limit we want to set. So it needs to be age appropriate. It needs to be relevant for us. It cannot be a limit that just because my friend is doing it, I saw my sister-in-law do it, I saw so-and-so do it, I saw it on TV. <laughs> That's not why we set limits. We set limits because this is my pain point and I need to work on this right now. Uh, we need to work on ourselves, so we need to be emotionally at the right place to be able to set this limit. Limits cannot be outsourced. So if you think that, you know, you're going to decide, okay, this is the limit I'm going to set, and then you're going to outsource it to a grandparent or, or support staff, your spouse, anything, it's not going to work. You need to pick a limit that you're going to be able to be there to enforce, to set. Um, and then you need to set that limit without anger and justification. Uh, because when we set limits with anger, we're looking at fear as the driver and that's not the ideal place to set limits from. And when we're trying to use justification to set limits, it's actually our own insecurity we're trying to feed. Children do not need that justification. If they had the ability to process why, they would have the ability to set the limit for themselves. They're both not there. The way children understand. So if you look at any value in your house, your child doesn't do it because you told them. They do it because they see it being followed day in and day out by everybody. They, they, they learn through observation. So they will learn over a period of time that, okay, 
mom serious about this limit and i'm going to have to do it and then they're going to observe oh other people also do it or oh when i do this then this happens when i do this that this happens or this other adults also in my family are doing this so it is this understanding that helps them hold on to a limit and internalize a limit it can take time you need a lot of patience when you're setting limit limits but the results are fabulous uh, the results over the long term are fantastic because your child becomes that much more independent and a little bit of pain initially they are able to take it into their independent stride later i want you to visually think about limits as you know like a you know there, there are these jumpy apparatus so you have this small one when uh, children are really small you get this uh, one which is small it's like 3 feet wide and it's got a bar hand and a child just holds on to the bar handle and jumps and those are really soft and gentle limits which are appropriate for that age uh, again it's keeping in mind that child's requirement so it's 3 feet it's proportional to the child's size and the child's ability to experiment so it's really tight and then a parent is always standing around to enforce that limit then when your child grows a little bigger you might get a bigger trampoline with uh, maybe with with a net around it so that they can jump with comfort but they don't have to fall off and then there's this trampoline which has th- this bouncy castle which has these walls around it and children love to jump against that wall and fall down and jump up and ju- jump against the wall uh i'm so sorry mirza it's not properly audible um i'm not sure what more i could do other than this uh please i i'm going to try to speak up even louder and hopefully that will do the job so for children limits are like the walls of a bouncy castle it gives them the comfort and the ability to jump higher and with more confidence so children need limits for confidence in themselves now what do we do as a parent to help that we need to be ready for tantrums and upsets because the walls are like them pushing against the limit you've made it so if you've decided bedtime is going to be 9 o'clock i promise you your child is going to want to challenge that bedtime at 9 o'clock and we need to be that wall of comfort to say i know i know you want to sleep longer but i'm sorry we're going to have to go to sleep now and that's the tone and that's the comfort with which we set that limit to make it safe for our child to stay within that bouncy castle we don't tell them okay leave the bouncy castle now that is a sign of we're not in a position to handle that child but if we want to set that limit and set it effectively we need to be that wall which is gentle which gently pushes them back into the trampoline and allows them that safety to be able to explore their zone of comfort their play area and we define the limits as parents because we are the ones with the cognitive ability to be able to do that so there are times when parents have so i i, I remember there was this one parent who came to me and said oh, oh i'm glad now it's fine thanks mirza for the feedback so there's a parent who came to me regarding tv um, their child was watching television at every meal and uh, you know how 3 year olds are when you they start doing that food is in their mouth and the meal takes forever they're not self feeding they're not thinking mindfully about their food while they're eating and i told the parent you know we need to go cold turkey on the television and the mother was distraught she said oh my god it's my child like my child lives for watching that episode of 20 minutes and you're telling me to just stop it cold turkey and she had a lot of feelings around letting go of that for her child because she felt her child was enjoying it so much she felt it made her meal times easier there were many feelings that came with that uh, episode being with that episode being watched during that meal time however they uh, they were committed to it and they gave it a shot two days later i got a message and she said he's not even asking for it it stopped there is no need for this episode there is no need for a tablet during meal times my child is eating food without a tablet I'm sharing with you one story but I have countless stories of this repeated pattern again and again and again whenever parents have come in 
and set that limit with confidence after working on their own feelings, the child has been able to let go of addictive behaviors like television like that. It's taken no time because that is not what is central to the child. What is central to the child is us and how we are bringing that limit in and what are the emotions we are bringing to the table when we're setting that limit. Uh, I've worked, I mean, the same thing, we're talking about toilet training. I had a parent who came to me with a child who was five years old, another one who came to me with a child who was eight years old, and they had been trying and trying and trying to set limits with toilet training. And again, it took nothing more than a week to get that child to go into that habit of being able to use the toilet appropriately. Because we needed to set that limit. We needed to know which limit to set. We needed to set it without getting flustered and emotional and angry. And then when we brought in that limit, the child accepted it with much more ease. Uh, I just want to close today's session by, uh, by making it abundantly clear that setting limits is not easy. And setting limits requires patience from you. And it needs you to be able to handle a child crying. So if you're going to be scared of those tears, setting limits is going to be that much more difficult for you. So with that, best of luck. Welcome those tears. Welcome working on your own feelings and picking one limit at a time. And let's hear it for this week of setting limits. This is Megha Mawandia from Trio talking to you today about setting limits during these quarantine times. Until next week, take care.